Are you looking to put together a solid, versatile, but reasonably priced system for shooting overhead video? Stay tuned. Hello world, my name is Matt Spa, and I am a photographer, videographer, and lover of elegant solutions in Atlanta, Georgia. Professional looking overhead footage can add a lot to your videos. It's great, of course, for unboxings and reviews and things like that, but I've used it in my DIY videos, particularly the background ones to show how I was moving paint around. I've used it to diagram simple concepts by just rolling out some paper, putting a camera overhead, and drawing out what it was that I was trying to explain. I've used a number of different techniques for getting my overhead footage from precariously balanced tripods to to gorilla pods where the legs were just wrapped around exposed ceiling joists. All of those worked, but none of those were what I would call elegant solutions. Most of the DIY solutions that I found were either too expensive, too complicated, or too purpose specific. They took a long time to set up or they had to remain in place or something like that. So I have created what I feel like is an elegant solution. And today I'm gonna to walk you through all the components, the assembly, the uh, camera settings, and provide some helpful hints to help you get better overhead footage. The core of this rig is the almighty C-Stand. This C-Stand is my favorite budget option. It comes from Adorama. It's 10 feet tall and it's very heavy duty. If you opt for the package deal, you can get a caster base that has three wheels, which will allow you to leave this thing set up and just roll it out of the way whenever you're not using it. C-Stands come with a graduated leg system that allows you to put the highest leg toward the weight that's on top of the stand, giving you maximum stability. This works great, but I also like to include a sandbag with mine. This is the sandbag that I use. I get these from Amazon. They're not the heaviest duty option out there, but they do hold sand. I put my sand into Ziploc bags, stick a bag in each pouch, and if you max them out, you can actually make a sandbag that's about 20 pounds, which will give you lots of stability. The last thing that's included with this setup is a 40 inch extension arm and two grip heads. These grip heads are what allow you to attach scrims, flags, lights, in our case, we're actually going to put a camera on the end and use the grip head to hold our light. So let me clear off my desk and we'll put together what I feel like is an elegant solution. Step number one is to bring your C-Stand in as close as possible to your work surface and secure it. I'm using the mobile base, so I've locked down all three casters and I've added a sandbag. By moving it in close, you can minimize the distance that this extension arm has to extend and it helps keep everything solid. The extension arm is threaded on both ends. On one end it has a quarter 20 and on the other end it has 3 8 inch threads. On those 3 8 inch threads, we're gonna add this small ball head. This is the NRL D30. It's a solid little unit that comes with a number of accessories. You get a pair of base plates, which is nice, four quarter inch to 3 8 inch adapters, a removable aluminum handle that makes adjustments easier, and a spring-loaded mobile phone holder with a cold shoe mount at the top. With the ball head in place, we can turn our thoughts to lighting. To get the most light and even light in a compact package, I have gone with a 19-inch ring light. I have to be honest, I always found ring lights kind of cheesy and creepy. That crazy glowing halo donut around the pupil and the reflections of the eyes just always freaked me out. But since I've had this thing around, I have really, really enjoyed using it. The light I'm using is a bicolor unit made by Klar. It's not what you'd call heavy duty, but we need something lightweight for this application. It's dimmable, it can be run off 120 volt AC power or Sony NPF batteries, and it provides plenty of light for a setup like this. 
The light attaches to the grip head kind of underneath like this so that when the camera is in place, it's centered in the middle of the ring, but the lens is also kind of flush with the light. By keeping it under here, if you have a flippy screen on your camera, you can use it for monitoring. And it also allows you to put a microphone on the top. The microphone that I'm gonna use is the Movo VXR10, a solid little performer that I've done a couple of other videos on. One thing to keep in mind with the Movo mic is that it has extremely high output. So you really want to make sure that you're monitoring your audio levels to make sure that your voiceover isn't clipping. By using a small ball head in the hot shoe mount on my camera, I'm able to mount this microphone so that when the base plate gets screwed into the ball head, it is pointing straight at my voiceover hole. With all the components in place, we can talk about camera settings and general usage tips. The settings that I'm going to give you are just based on the size and scope of what I've been using this rig for. If you're doing something super tiny or something huge, all of this is going to change, but these will give you a starting point if you just want to play around with your rig. The first number is 30 inches, and that's the distance from the work surface to the lens. The next number is 35 millimeters, and that's the focal length of this lens. 35 mil lens at 30 inches gives me a reasonably sized work area without a lot of distortion. As focal length decreases, the uh, scene of course gets wider, but distortion increases. And 35 mil, 30 inches, looks very natural to my eye and gives me plenty of room to work. My shutter speed is 1 50th of a second because I ultimately publish at 24 frames per second. My aperture is f5.6. 5.6 gives me a little bit of depth of field, but not too much. If you go to a super shallow depth of field, your autofocus is constantly going to be hunting for that thing that it thinks it's supposed to be looking at. And that just gets nerve wracking to me. So 5.6 was a good compromise there. The last setting is ISO. And before I talk about ISO, I wanna talk about the work surface. Reflective work surfaces will not work with this just because the light's so close to the lens, it just, it doesn't look good to me. So I'm using some flat black foam core which of course is going to affect my exposure. If this was white foam core, it would be bouncing a lot more of this light up. So anyway, to do a little test, I've got Puccini's Lab OM CD set here. One side has a very dark photo, the other side has a very light back with just some type on it. If I turn the light on full, and I turn the camera on, and I put this dark photo on this dark background, I have to adjust my ISO to 400 to get a properly exposed image. And I'm shooting HLG, so no overexposure for S-Log or any of that foolishness. Just 400 gives me a properly exposed image. If I flip this over to the lighter side and readjust, I'm at 125. So an ISO range on a light item of 125 to 400 on a dark item, totally, totally usable to me. And a lot of that has to do with the proximity of the light. This isn't a very long distance for that light to fly, but that does it really for settings. I'm gonna turn this off because it's in my eyes. Last thing to talk about is framing. I will take this ruler and I will set it at the edge of the frame. You'll notice I am able to use my flippy screen on my a7 III to monitor my footage, which is cool because this camera gets a bad rap for its non-articulating flippy screen. The image is upside down, but I can see at least what's in the frame. If I don't want to deal with that, I will set this ruler at the edge of the frame. I will peel off some painter's tape and set it just outside the frame on all four sides. Then if I don't want to look at that or deal with that, I can work down here and kind of know where I am in the frame. Hugely helpful. Everything about this has worked well, but there is one drawback to it. And it's just the fact that because you have so much hanging out here on the end of that one arm, when you touch it, it wiggles for a minute before it can come to rest. And that can be a problem. What I have done to get around that is I actually use my phone to start and stop the camera so I'm not having to reach up and push the button. But that really has been the only major drawback. I don't know if it's major. It's been the only downside to putting this thing together. The more I've worked with it, the more versatile I have found it is. And I'm already working on a follow-up video to this wherein I take all of this 
add just a couple of additional components and try to turn this into a complete YouTube filming solution that you could use for uh, talking head stuff like this or product work or anything else. So keep an eye out for that. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that it was helpful in some way. If it was, subscribe, ring my bell, tell two friends, give me a nice sweet comment down below. If you didn't like it, you can of course punch that thumbs down button, but leave me a comment on that too and let me know what it was that you didn't like about it. I know I'm not gonna please everybody, but if I can make it better, I'll make it better. That's it for this one, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.